So, I mean, I will say officially, hello everybody to this transdisciplinary conversation. And yeah. I think many of the invited uh, people today don't actually know more or less what the idea of this is. And it's just a conversation uh, for people with very different backgrounds, for example, acting right. or science, uh, to talk about common uh, topics that can be of common interest to everybody. And yeah. uh, we have done things about the consciousness, uh, free will, uh, science and sports, you know. Yeah. And, and today I wanted to talk about improvisation and storytelling because I know there are glasses that have been done here in Caltech for many years. And uh, many scientists have been done it. And I know there are multiple benefits of doing both things in our daily lives, not right. just as scientists, but also people. Uh, so um, basically, I mean, first we can start by introducing ourselves. Uh, I am Sophia, I'm an astronomer, scientist okay. in Caltech, PMA. Uh, what about you? <laughs> Bam. 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 That's it, man. Yeah. Introduce yourself, so, man. <laughs> uh, my name, am I talking to you? I we are talking to like whatever is online. Hi. Yeah, just me. <laughs> I'm Brian Brophy. Yeah. I am the director of Caltech Theater, story coach at JPL, and story coach. Wow. Well, story coach. Yeah. Story coach. I want to know more about that too. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And uh, father of two daughters. <laughs> so, How old are they? 29 and 27. Wow. And it's going to be 27. <laughs> um yes and uh, i've been here at contact for 16 years 16 wow yeah yeah, yeah. you can tell a lot of funny anecdotes about Caltech life mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> 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 uh, what about what about you this <laughs> <laughs> adam oh hello uh, adam. <laughs> and I'm teaching uh improv here at caltech brian was gracious enough to sort of open the door for me here let me I guess since only this past fall, so mm -hmm. ever since two, two terms, two terms, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. two quarters, but two terms, how, two terms yeah. yeah. But I have a background in comedy and, and acting and writing, mm -hmm. and um, studied theater basically. Mm -hmm. And um, no, I don't say this in a self-deprecating or humble way, but mm -hmm. uh, yes, but um, <laughs> failed almost all of my science classes. Like, <laughs> uh, a, small, a, bit, a, a truly abysmal science, student, mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it's it, it, the irony of, of me being at a place like this going. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. it's, it's thank you for having me. Thank you for <laughs> uh, retaking a passion for science. Yeah, in a very unexpected, unique way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a second year graduate student in social and decision neuroscience program here at Caltech. I have the opposite background as Adam. Mm. My background has been science, 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 mm. and basically no art. <laughs> but then, yeah, I discovered art and I realized, okay, that's a story of human experience and science cannot, it's just not exclusive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's something more intertwined mm -hmm. with art. But yeah, basically I was born in India and, the, and the, there was a rat race phenomenon there. Mm -hmm. Just you want to always have a goal in mind, just go in that direction. So Yeah, mm -hmm. a goal in what direction? Science, science, science? Or science, 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 science. But, some uh, indicator of human success, say, or it will be social indicator of success. Right. Like mm -hmm. you have to achieve some belt or like proposition in society, or yeah. And engineering is the right. playing part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But and what did you What did you do your undergrad? I did my undergrad in electrical engineering. Oh, that's so sexy. Uh, yeah, I'm Indian. But where, what? Which I have uh, oh yeah, because Brian was in India. He was just there. Yeah, was there. you were there. Yeah. You have been there many yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> I said I think I'm in Naga. I got in Gujarat. I think Gujarat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was there for six weeks. I had Adam been teaching the improv, and I had other people coming in to do the storytelling class, yeah. which has been was terrific. Well, I did it last night. So. Yeah, and it's something that resonated with me when you say like, okay, I wanted. I wanted science, 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 and then I discovered something else and, and discovered a part of myself that I, I didn't realize that I have, I guess. That's my paraphrasing of what you said. Mm -hmm. And I think it's maybe the experience of many of the students. I mean, yesterday we had this presentation yeah. of the storytelling class, plus mm -hmm. improv, right. and it really resonated also with me, like the words of the, the three people that presented, yeah. you know, saying that, that the, there's so many ways of doing science or being a scientist. And uh, especially in Caltech, which is so much about excellence, right? About the analytical part, theoretical part of the experiments, you know, but we are humans, you know, 
and discovering that Sai actually makes us very scientists. So I, I really thought that this was like the place to, to, I don't know, find this common ground about like, okay, besides like just literally, you know, sitting in a computer yeah. and analyzing data or like moving some, I'm not a chemist, I don't yeah. know, I mean, moving some pipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, so I mean, I, I have a list of questions that I prepare, yeah. you know, and we can use them as a guide or we can just like flow and see how it goes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, first of all, actually, uh, maybe for the people who are not very acquainted with the terms in particular and, and what you're doing, what does it mean to do storytelling and to do improvisation? So if like, for example, Brian can do a definition of uh, storytelling and you can do a yeah. definition of improv mm -hmm. you know, for everybody in the audience. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is it. Uh, <laughs> well, I think scientists tell two stories. One is about how they became a scientist and who they are and what they want, the aspirational. But the other one is their science. What is the science that they're doing? And then who are they as a scientist? Mm -hmm. So I think that you have to look at you know, what is the story that you want to tell? You want to tell your, you know, tell me all about your science. You know, tell me all about your neuroscience research that you're doing. And find out about that. Well, that's really interesting. And, uh, mm -hmm. Something that may or may not engage me, but I will be more likely to be engaged about your journey into doing your science. So it allows me to identify with you in a way that makes me care about your story. Because if you just tell me about that's this good. diagram on the wall <laughs> and be like, that's really cool to say how you know yeah. science, that. Like, this was there before we arrived yeah. and that's great you know and it depends on uh, how compelling the science is in some ways but I think it has to connect to the life of the audience I think that the audience has to have some investment in order to care about the story that they're hearing and we have to make them care mm -hmm. about the science and i think with uh, scientific storytelling right so that's a different so there's i'm just going to tell a, a story about my science but then i'm going to tell a story about how uh how how can there is the uh, scientific method right you observe you have a hypothesis that you think this might happen mm -hmm. and then uh, you test it out, you do a few things, and then it, it kind of maybe rises up and you find, oh my God, I did that experiment. This is what happened. You're so excited, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to tell everyone what happened and the results. And, you know, did this, um, did this research, uh, what was it replicable? Mm -hmm. Were you able to reproduce this? Maybe not. <laughs> so mm -hmm. as you're kind of on the other side of this, you know, science equation, um, traditional narrative you could you could overlay traditional dramatic narrative on if you just look at uh, exposition, right? So you and I are talking about this this uh, amino acid research, right? Mm -hmm. And then you were starting to see a rising tension, right? a rising tension. Like, oh, you're not going to be able to do this. You don't know about this. You don't know about this. Like, I know I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Oh, I just found this new amino acid. It's like this is freaking amazing. And I'm like, I wouldn't have found this thing out. Like, <laughs> you're up at the top. Like, oh my god, this is great. But now what? I've kind of got to the top of this thing. Oh, did you really do this? Yeah, I did. Here are the results. I'm going to like show my peers and they're going to peer review it. And they're going, this is actually pretty good. And then, of course, then you get the Nobel Prize. My point is that you can take the scientific method and scientific storytelling overlay dramatic, traditional, classical, totally narrative structure. And they kind of merge together. I mean, Francis Arnold, I think, is a great example of that. Of just all the different you know, the early career and, and she went through so many different professions to like, mm -hmm. end up where she is. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of pushback and a lot of her research. And then she finally gets to the point where like, I'm using these new, you know, there's, there's this new research to direct evolution mm -hmm. in some way mm -hmm. that will help the planet, right? So you see all that she gets to that point, then she gets a Nobel and now <laughs> she has to prove all that. Mm -hmm. And now she has a startup company that continues to do um the the, mm. the work that she's doing right so mm. I, I find her like a classical example of a mm. of a hero mm. a female a female scientist whatever mm. male female doesn't matter non-binary mm -hmm. it's that the scientist the scientist does the research makes it happen and that they are we talk about being heroes 
And I, mm -hmm. this is kind of our hero of the story. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, no, there are really no heroes in science. The hero's oh. journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the hero's journey. Yeah. And, and the, mm -hmm. well, is she a hero or are the grad students that did a lot of those work, are they part of the heroes? Mm -hmm. Or or is the directed evolution that she's kind of working on, is that the hero? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. the idea mm -hmm. is the hero. The idea is the hero. Well, it and it should be, right? But it's, it's told to humans. So they, as you say, like the, the storytelling is to allow the humans to understand, you know, a right. way to communicate, right? Because something is like you understand the result, but if you don't talk about it, right. you know, who's going to use it right. to advance in science, right? And at the same time, I really, you know, um, uh, connect also with what you say about uh, you have to choose what to tell. Right? Mm, yeah. And I don't know if you have that impression sometimes when you're preparing a presentation or when you're writing a scientific paper, I noticed like you're right to the final point it is like what is the story that I'm going to tell yeah. and it's not sequential it's not necessarily no, it's not like from the beginning of the idea to the end you don't tell that story right the story is what is the, what is the main idea what is the idea and how do I tell the story that drives to that conclusion in a sequential and pragmatic and right. efficient way right so it turns out that like months of work sometimes lead to nothing written in a paper and it's super frustrating yeah. or something that you thought about one minute it's actually that relevant and has to be there yeah. you know so and it's the same as you're talking about your day right you don't tell everything yeah. like i wake up you know i don't know wash, brush my teeth right. you, know? <laughs> you tell like the, the exciting parts that make the day worth it right yeah it's all about the story and I think that's a mm -hmm. lot where improvisation can can sort of like aid in the in the or some of the sort of ethics and tenets of improv can really, I don't know, I imagine would be sort of applicable to the scientific community in that, yes, because improv is very much about like um, letting go of any preconceived notion of what the scene, the improv scene is going to be, but like more broadly, just like being uncomfortable, being comfortable with failure, failing over, oh, and, yeah. over and over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and being comfortable with discomfort, not knowing what the next, literally the next moment is going to bear and sort of being comfortable and living in that uncertainty. I'm like, we're saying you could do research for years and years and years and not quite get the result you want. And I think that one of the, or that you were expecting at least. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the sort of tenets of improv that is so sort of broadly valuable is to just sort of like um, sit with that feeling and then uh, be comfortable uh, dealing with not what you've expected to happen, but what actually is happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where improv, and you know, I was, I remember reading years ago that Alan Alda, the famous actor who is a wonderful famous actor, he started, and I think he's also like a science buff and loves science. I think he started an improv for science program. I, I want to say at Stony Brook maybe or some really? Susan. Oh, yeah. And and his whole thing, but as for sort of the big takeaway was um to, to your point, Sophia, about the scientists being able to communicate their research and their work to the layman who doesn't not may not be familiar with um the ins and outs of the scientific theory or the scientific method or any, you know, one of the myriad of complicated things that you guys Think of that all the time. Mm -hmm. Me, for example, I wouldn't understand that. Um, but uh, me for, neither. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so to be at like to be able to, I think, to piggyback off what Brian said, I think the idea of um, being flexible, the improv really trains the brain and sort of like hones that skill of flexibility and adaptability, instantaneous adaptability in the moment. And I think that could, I imagine that that could help in both scientific research and like the work of science, but to your point, Sophia, most importantly in the communication of it yeah. and being able to um, tell a story. I mean, like I have a four-year-old and so to me, like storytelling is the only way that, I mean, what's that Joan Didion quote of like, you know, we tell ourselves st stories in order to live. It's the only way that we, not the only, but like from ancient humankind, it's like, you know, this is the way that we orient ourselves in the world is through storytelling. And, you know, if I were to like explain H2O to my four-year-old, they'd be like, okay, here's a hydrogen molecule and then they <laughs> a little hydrogen molecule. And then, oh, who's this over here? It's an oxygen molecule. <laughs> and like the whole thing is story, is like crafting a story um, because that to me is the, is like the main way that humans are able to understand the world yeah. and orient themselves. And you remember of these books, I, I don't know, Quantum Mechanics for Babies. Yeah, exactly. yeah. exactly. It's like that, right. you know? Right. And it's so crazy how they manage to yes. ex explain in such a simple term something that seems so complex, yes. right? And this quality of finding the core of the idea. Yes. And maybe it's not exactly, you know, precise, yes. but it's the intention, you know, the, yes. the behind meaning, I mean, the meaning behind whatever idea you have, right. you know, this quality of these books to explain it, I find yes. it fascinating, yeah. you know? Yeah, and they're quite good, yeah.
like explaining black holes of babies. And besides, you mentioned also brains. And yes. I think that's where, I mean, I was really happy that Sneha said that she wanted to come today. Yeah. <laughs> because I know that she works with brains. Yes. And you told me a little bit about a project you have with improv. So I don't know if you want to tell us a few words about that. Yeah. Oh, actually, I actually want to follow up on what Adam just said. I, told, I mean, uh, your uh, take on how stories are the way we orient mm -hmm. ourselves in the world is perfectly spot on. Because I think stories are the basis for formation of memory. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you go to a conference, you hear hundreds of talks and over four days and you just nothing sticks out. And if you really present yourself in a compelling and a, a, a clear, coherent, narrative fashion that just sticks with you forever. Right, right, totally. Yeah. And that's how we process memories. Anything that's uh, anything that sticks with you is the one that's gonna survive. Not the not the best idea, not the thing that's going that will change the world, but something that sticks with you. It's emotional. Yeah, it's emotional. Yeah, and that, that's what propagates, and it really right. helps propagating your propagation of your ideas and. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's always most of these ideas are just chance, mm -hmm. uh, some, because humans are producing lots of scientific output every day, mm -hmm. and and we need to pro convince people to come on board with us because it's a collective endeavor. Right. And oh, the more people we get on board, the more funding for the for the required projects, and the more um, the more pro area progresses. Yeah. I mean that that can only happen if we communicate ourselves right. and just bring people on board and right. get them excited. You said something before in your sort of preface to the stories last night, which was, you know, you just made sort of a mention to us like we're living in this very complicated era of like misinformation, scientific skepticism, et cetera. We're like living in the thick of that right now. Um, and I think that it what, you know, one of the things that can combat that is like crystal clear narrative people, scientists who can really communicate clearly and to your point emotionally. Because that is that those are the things that make the deepest imprints on our consciousness, and and to your point, that propagate and stick with us, or like these, um, like um, are the way we feel about it, <laughs> the way we feel about things. Yeah. So I think that like crystal clear communicators, um, and like even if you think about like, and again, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna gonna sort of betray my ignorance here in terms mm -hmm. of science. So please, a blanket apology for all of that. But like the 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 few, like the few- You like, really have to preface Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I actually I don't, don't know so anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So forgive me. I've been, yeah. I've been here over here. So sorry, forgive him. He knows not what he said yeah. or done somebody. Seriously, you know something, you know? I mean, and, yeah. I mean, and the idea is like, I mean, if you, do, if you don't know, it's fine because like, yeah. Like there's so many things that I don't know. Yeah. And and the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. So maybe you know quite yeah, a lot. Yeah, He's very humble. Yes, maybe so. Much. Yeah. Uh, but I was just thinking of like the people that have like the, the people in the scientific community that have mm -hmm. broken through to like become pop cultural figures. I'm thinking of, and I can't even remember his name, but he was just speaking here at Caltech. He's that YouTuber who has all the million billions oh, subscribers. Yeah. He like just gave a talk here, whatever, but he was <laughs> Do you know who he is? No, no, I can put it later in the editing. Anyway, yeah, later, yeah. The magic of edition. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's, there's a picture of him in Beckman Mall. In Beckman Mall, oh, Trillium, really? right? You're not talking about Kip Thorne, right? So no, not Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne, no, they no, give no. a talk like Yeah, yeah. Another guy was a... It's like a young guy. A like vlogger. Ah, it's like a Beckman Auditorium, and he was like holding his arms out like this in front of a... Wow. 300... 300 people. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he was like a JPL guy turned internet YouTube science guy. Mm -hmm. um, or even like your Neil deGrasse Tyson, whatever. These are people who have real command of storytelling and of narrative and are, of course, in and of themselves, charismatic and charming and magnetic personalities, which helps. Um, but um, mm -hmm. um, actually, yeah. yeah, that's a, a good question to like continue to unpack yeah. because it's like uh, I have one here. It's like, what ways can storytelling improvise and be used to create a more effective and engaging presentation? Yeah. Or like communication as we as scientists. Yeah. And yeah. do you, I mean, do you have- Here it? I have a JPLer turned YouTuber, Mark Rober. Mark Rober. Mark Rober. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came home from business. It's like a rover, wow. you know, like a rover. Yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just to speak. Yeah. Rover spoke about how he uses humor and creativity to bring science and engineering concepts yes. to a broad audience. Okay, exactly. so exactly, exactly that. So did yeah. you learn something about <laughs> yeah. what, what is your experience, you know? Uh -huh. Crystal Dilworth liked it and 2,000 other people did. Yeah. Oh, wow. And he's insanely popular and he was mm -hmm. like a GPL. That's 
The image I was saying. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? Rock and stop. What is yeah. the key aspects to make a person like that so? <laughs> yeah, to show the people that I am. Uh... <laughs> 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 this mission has been like quite unique with respect to the previous yeah. ones. <laughs> yeah. But, I've been uh, watching this live. Uh, I, I'm there, maybe. Yeah. 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 But if if not, they will be uploaded. Yes. Yeah. Right? I'm going to make a reference that is like, go with me here. This is a bit of a long walk, but there was one of my favorite Saturday Night Live sketches and mm -hmm. characters was um, uh, Vanessa Bayer, the cast member played a bar mitzvah boy. And she would come to the weekend update desk and set, and the, the bit was that she had her little bar mitzvah speech prepared and she was so nervous and she wouldn't stray from what she had written. And Seth Meyers, the host, was like, that's really great, uh, uh, Benjamin, but um, just want to listen up and just have a conversation. And she was so petrified and couldn't improvise and couldn't be in the moment at all that she just referred to, she went right back to her like scripted thing. And I think that that is, to your point about like um, what makes effective communicators mm -hmm. is like, and again, you take it for granted because like, talking and being in the world and interacting on any level is improvising on some level you're, yeah. you're all the that's time what it is, that's what <laughs> life. is and communication is exactly yeah um but um uh, i think that just simply the more comfortable you are in the moment and um like i said being sort of flexible oh wasn't expecting that question let me sort of think about that for a minute or wasn't exactly like like to your point about like uh done all this research that wasn't what i was expecting let mm -hmm. me sort of take that in and pivot to what is actually happening in reality i think is like um critical i mean it just feels pretty cool. so, yeah. yeah have you had moments like that where yes, yeah exactly. like what's can you tell us that I was actually giving, I was part of an astro astronomy club. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and I was supposed to give a lecture to, to the audience on history of astronomy. Mm. Oh. Imagine how splendid that was. Yeah. It was so crazy. Yeah. I bombed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was this, I was followed by this another guy, a senior guy, who is an excellent public speaker. Mm -hmm. He just goes there and owns the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next day we were having lunch together. I asked him, dude, I tanked it completely. Like, yeah. what is your secret? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he looks at me and says, Sneha, you have a lot of shame. You need to get rid of it. Oh, yes. my God. <laughs> shame. shame. Yes. What an interesting word. Shameless. That did that makes a good public speaker. It's like, huh, that's a good point. Easier. Uh, yeah. You need to have a little bit of like a sure. I don't know if I should use the word cocky confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you have to be like uh, blatantly, you have to dare to be wrong. Right. And also uh, I would say more than yeah, yeah. what was the word you used? Uh, shame. 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 What was the but you have what, to be like, vulnerable? What, what, is, what do you tell it mm -hmm. to you in? Was it in English? It was in English because oh. we speak different languages. Oh. Ah, true. Different languages. Yeah, I'm just wondering because it sounds different, you know, in Bengali or it sounds different in, in, in another yeah. Indian regional dialect too, you know. Yeah. But so it's interesting. It was an English kind of thing because that's shame has a long history, like within mm -hmm. like, Catholicism and mm -hmm. like Western religion, Usually, yeah. right? Versus like, wow, oh, what an interesting word to use, mm -hmm. like because it like. What should I be shameful for? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. I should be, as opposed to I, I don't know. Just validate the fact that you bombed. I mean, just like, what's your secret? What's your secret? Like, you should be. You should <laughs> but I mean, I think like it sounds very similar. There are two words that sound very similar, but maybe in the context was right. But something similar is just to be vulnerable, which is different to be, be ashamed. Vulnerable. Oh, and I think that's a very key word. Shame. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's very important. Uh, like, oh, do you think shame. he was playing with? <laughs> no, but shame is still a is still a good concept to talk about because we all thrive on like social acceptance and everything. Mm -hmm. Feel like uh, what the personification of us in the minds of others mm -hmm. that's very important to us. Mm -hmm. So how we talk and how we act, uh, and we constantly keep track of okay, what he might be thinking, what they might. Think. Tell me that. And, uh, the minute you get rid of that. And the minute you know, okay, I am human, I, I, am, I make mistakes, and I, I can laugh at myself. In the way, when you get comfortable with that, I think that's when you really like really see Yeah, that, that, I, that I don't know everything. Is that something that you preface when you're talking about things? Like, because um, you're, you're, you're neurobiology, you've got an engineer. So what was your background again? I was just... Uh, I was purely computa uh, computational and technical. Uh, computational, technical, more, uh-huh. I came from that. But now I'm in the humanities and social sciences. Mathematics oh. and, so, and and neuroscience, yeah? Yes. No. Uh, humanities. Social sciences. Right. That, that word uh, 
like it's a it's a fusion of many different disciplines. It's very interdisciplinary. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Includes computer science, cognitive science, psychology, yeah. neuroscience, economics. Yeah, yeah. Because when we met in the fall, you were just deep into all that stuff. And then who did we talk to? I thought that we met with Penner. No. Oh, yeah, we did. That's what we met with. But that's not your PI. Yes, Do okay. Doherty. Uh, Doherty. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any improv experience? Have you ever done any improvisation or or acting or storytelling? Oh, oh with Brian. With, uh, with actually, the implicit club had a few sessions. Yeah. Just like uh, uh in introductory yeah. things. I went for a went for a couple of quarters. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's when I realized okay, improv is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I never. I, I received an email one day when I just got into Caltech. Mm -hmm. I think sometime in September, October, that there's an improv class starting tonight, mm -hmm. and I'm just. Uh, just looking for looking to meet new people right. because I just came. Yeah. And I had to Google what is improv. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds cool. I never did theater back in college because what I hate most is dictation. Mm -hmm. so a, a regular theater, you have to rehearse the same thing over and over again. So I felt like that would not really be my cup of tea. Kind of. But <laughs> improv, I felt like just be there, yeah. be spontaneous. Right. Like, okay, That's I for right. me, I like both. I like the repetition, which yeah. is ironic because I also like curiosity and, yeah. and changing. Yeah. Yeah. Also, on a very base human level, I mean, something that improv, it, I mean, it, it does like, it is innately collaborative, of course. And it, it's just like, uh, it fosters community. I mean, again, on a very basic human level, like Maslow or whatever, like hierarchy of needs style, like what we need, we just the, the thirst for human connection and um, collaboration in that way and sort of the idea sharing and the cultivating of group mm -hmm. mind that is so the whole point of improvisation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of making friends. <laughs> making friends, making friends, and then like taking that with you. And uh, I I, ima I can imagine that would only service collaborative work in any other discipline as well. Is, I yeah. mean, I would say people with a lot of social anxiety yeah. may feel that they will struggle in an environment like that. Right. But on the contrary, it's like, it's a tool to help them Completely. overcome that because you have to embrace the uncertainty. Completely. I think that's what it's, it's I guess, because I, I do not have social anxiety yeah, yeah. luckily uh i can just imagine how hard can it yeah. be you know because you're a human you need to interact but you are anxious about that same thing right, right. and because you have to improvise a conversation and you feel like you're ashamed of your own self <laughs> right. to communicate with other people but then you have to and it, there's no excuse you just go ahead and and be and and you are going to make a mistake and that's fine you it's know it's, in, in, it's exactly it's necessary yeah, mistakes it's, and the failure it's like in jazz you know you make exactly. it, mistakes to make it like part of the theme yeah right? that's right exactly <laughs> yeah and it, mm -hmm. to be totally frank too it's like even in the context of the the class that we have had this past mm -hmm. term or whatever i've seen um in subtle ways like even in body language some of the people i feel like who began the term as like a little more hands in pockets introverted no did, like literally didn't want to wanted to turn their back to the audience like just over time with a little bit more like you know come like feeling the support of their teammates and the camaraderie and also just like the practice of it um I, I'm like to me it's like a subtle thing but like seem almost like entirely different people by the end of the thing um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe it would be nice to tell us a little bit what do you do in a standard class of improv? How do you start? What, what kind of thing? I mean, I know because I have yeah, there is, yeah, yeah, but you know, know. Like, like, yeah. they plan like hours. Oh, you're just like, you... hey guys, go there and do something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like there, you know. Um, I am certainly no expert, but like I, there are a million different like get, there's short form improv and there's long form improv and like short form improv is like games, millions of different games to play um, that are just sort of like going to the gym for your brain. You know what I mean? It's like go, just working out those muscles, um, just sort of, you know, kicking off the, the dust a little bit and like stretching those creativity, creative, abstract thinking muscles. And like, that's what sort of the short form improv games are for. And also to get your body, which I think is another mm -hmm. thing that uh, again, like, scientific work I can imagine is so sort of neck up kind of deal. And um, in my 
experience of life. Like, uh, and again, maybe this is just me personally, but like my bot, like my brain doesn't really work unless my body, <laughs> unless my body is involved somehow. So I think that like, that's to me, been my experience of my own cognitive abilities that if I'm static for too long, or just sitting still for too long, my brain just like shuts down a little bit. So I think like the short form games serve to get everyone in their body and, uh, and also just sort of warm up those muscles. And then the long form improv, um, we were working this in this class, we're working on a particular form called the Herald, but there's many, many different kinds of improv forms, um, like uh, a mono scene, for example, which is just like one location that uh, the improvisers just sort of like build a whole world in one locale. Um, but there's so many different kinds of them. But I mean, in our class, we would really just like start with some physical warm up and play some short form games and then uh, get into some like two person longer scene work just to sort of, again, like get into the vibe of saying yes to your partner and um, <laughs> sort of implementing some of those tenets of improv. Uh, and then trying to hone a long form, which in our case was the Herald. Yeah, place. actually yeah. my favorite short game was the scene painting. Yeah. Which like, we are like the scene painting when you're in like a semicircle yeah. and you, I don't know, start proposing something like, I don't know, uh, there is a statue in the middle of a room and then like there's a banana over here and then they connect the two like there's another person who falls into the banana and then everybody's contributing and creating a scene That's you know right. a collective scene that is a uh, increased you know in description by every person you know that's right and you can kind of feel it you know you see yeah, it adds and then, on to it get the deeper in yeah the exactly yeah. there's so many layers and then you can actually even you said that create another improvisation inside of that world that right. you just created right? right yeah yeah so yeah there's also an ego not to get too like woo about it but there's also like a bit of a necessary and to me like productive like ego death that you need to like be an improviser because you're doing it as a group and again like you may have a really funny idea or a really specific funny idea that you are going to walk out and like initiate the scene with this idea but if it's not communicated clearly to yeah. your partners and mm -hmm. to your teammates it's not going to happen and they'll all of a sudden you have to sort of roll with that so there is i think a um a a comfort that one must develop with um really surrender surrender being comfortable and actually with surrender. there's yeah. also the other way around i think that's the things we need to improve the most when we are starting improvising yeah. is not also not to be ashamed right. <laughs> to, use your words, right. to uh cut out and propose something new you yeah. know we are too respectful sometimes yeah. from the ideas of the people but you have to be quick 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 and to change that so, so be afraid to change and propose right. and, and be very dynamic that was make people from the audience and to like, mm -hmm. actually even enjoy more, you know, this dynamic mm -hmm. of creation and create over creation over creation. Absolutely. And yeah, sometimes the other things go too long, and then it's like, okay, I should have cut here, you know. Right. I, I can propose something new, and yeah. it's fine, you know, because yeah. it's about the creation, not about like sustaining something. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. One of the uh, the UCB, which is the improv comedy theater that I have trained at most, mostly, their sort of slogan. It's a little like culty and like a little bit eye rolly, but it's uh, don't think. That's the whole point is like to act and to 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 be bold mm -hmm. and to initiate a new idea before you've thought about it. That's sort of the whole point mm -hmm. um, is to not let your and, you know, I watched there's a pretty interesting TED talk by I can't remember his name. It's a scientist, maybe like Charles Lynn, maybe. But it was about what maybe you've seen this because it's like what the brain is doing um, or like the, the sort of like neurological um, activity during improv. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was saying that you know, and he ran all these experiments and uh, and he had people go into an MRI machine basically, or like a CAT scan thing and measure their brain activity when they were reciting um, learned dialogue mm -hmm. versus when they had to do improvised dialogue and all like, you probably, okay, probably know all this already, uh, <laughs> but it was like all sorts of new brain activity when you're improvising, you're like, you literally, your visual cortexes are lighting up in ways that they didn't before. And um, the uh, and the part of the motor, fine motor skills, motor skills are activated in a way that they weren't before. And most profoundly to me was like the part of your brain, and again, there's a technical term for it that I don't know, but it's like that is your uh, sensor, self sensor mm -hmm. um, mechanism is limited. So it's like that. Executive control. Say again. Executive control. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, like, what could be more beautiful and profound than that? This idea of like when you're improvising, mm -hmm. you uh, don't, your brain like isn't registering shame that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, it, like, yeah. Is <laughs> your, Sneha, is your science have it connected to what he was describing? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, my science is about uh, how people coordinate uh, spontaneously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so basically, how people differ when they coordinate spontaneously versus when they do not, and what regions of the brains are working together. Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, yeah, a few months ago, actually, somebody I don't even remember anymore who sent me a link about an article uh, about this mirror game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there's there's uh, several versions of the mirror game. Yeah, you have two people in front of each other, and one moves, and they are trying to imitate, you know, mm -hmm. and then they change, right? And uh, there's another version in which they both move together mm -hmm. spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And they measure the activation time, you know, to follow. And they were more coordinated when they were doing both cool. in, improvised movements that one only following the other one, cool. which I found is fascinating. Yeah. I and mean, it's actually also connected to what you want to try to understand. Yeah, yeah. essentially, it, like people think when you think too much, you're uh, you're basically doing focusing on thinking and not responding. Not right. really, right? Just yeah. not acting anymore. You're mm -hmm. thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically, you need to stop thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and that goes back to what you were talking about a little bit earlier about oh, what are all these other people thinking about me? Yeah. <laughs> if you're just focused on like telling your yeah. shittiest version of, you know, an apologetic version. Let's take up the super <laughs> onion, yeah. you know, let's talk about that, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever it might be, you know, wave or particle theory, whatever you want to talk about. Right? This is my shitty version. I'm just going to own it. But because, there's people who have the, the other way around. You know what I mean? It's like, they really? Can... I know you know more than I do. I don't really care that you know more than I do. Yeah. This is what I know. This is what I'm presenting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think one of my research interests is how brain's capacity is limited. Because like any other physical system, we have bounded rationality. We have bounded resources. And if we diversify our resources into solving different kinds of problems or thinking about different things, that means lo less resource to the task at hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking what Sophia is thinking about me when I'm talking oh, about yeah, this, definitely. that yeah. makes resources of the thing oh. that I'm talking about. So, <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 let me put that slightly counter idea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you put too much pressure on focusing on doing it right, you know, you can tend to fail. But if you relax, you know, and sometimes think about something else, being one something, it can be better if you train before enough, right? Yeah. Yeah, that is consolidation that mm -hmm. happens when you're off the task, not while doing the task. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for instance, yeah, it's very important for your memories to consolidate and for you to be rejuvenated and um, basically take in all that you have learned during the day. Mm. But if you don't sleep, people try to forego sleep and think that they can power through, and that will just only be totally counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, really? yeah. The mm -hmm. same thing happens like when you are stuck on something, like focusing too much on yes. the work at hand. And when you move away and engage in something else, then things will click because your brain is now released and it's trying to find patterns subconsciously. At least that's yeah. the point of control. I definitely noticed and realized that fact like by chance when I was studying violin at school. I studied in a musical school, so I was very privileged. And uh, yeah, I, I got a task to learn, you know, certain score with certain yeah. musical parts and it was like trying 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 nothing work it's like ah who cares about this yeah. instrument on violin i throw it away you know yeah. i throw away my violin but not in a literal way yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then gently. and then like one hour or half an hour before the class is like shoot right. i have to practice and i grab the thing and it works yeah. it's like somehow my brain learn yeah. learn by itself you know yeah. what i mean while sleeping or what and it's like yeah i discovered it's like it's, it's just how you balance like learning you know practicing with like letting your self your subconscious you know to acquire the knowledge mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and, taking yeah. A break. <laughs> yeah definitely taking a break yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why i appreciate like so much having things outside of my science you know it's like i don't i mean I, we we living in a scientific world in which like you really need to put a lot of effort in order to work but if you like overdo it you know it doesn't necessarily lead to a better research yeah you know uh, I don't know if you have seen I think both in like the classes you have taught. You also do, uh, besides sto particularly storytelling, you have done a lot of uh, um, classes, courses for for postdocs and grad students about like how to you know embrace something. I mean, how to how to be better scientists through other things, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, something you know, this whole idea about embodied. You know, embodied cognition. People like use this phrase a lot, and the mm -hmm. social science word, it's the humanities word, but I think it's a mm -hmm. Neuroscience, were to a certain degree, but um, this idea that we the body knows so much, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so when you work, when so many, so when you are a scientist, you are really often, you know, really zeroed in on what your project is and what your research is, and doing the research 
well, over and over again, trying to replicate it and do all that. But sometimes the body is um, is left out of the equation, mm -hmm. you know, because we are we are sort of manifesting our. And, and you think like like the, the pandemic we just lived on. I mean, the virus is still around, you know. So uh, this constraint that we have for so many years to have to be like more time at home without social interactions. Well, that's, so been affected, that's, you know, that's what we found doing a lot of these workshops during, during COVID with postdocs and with the graduate students and with undergraduate students, that, that there was a real sense of loneliness and right. a sense of isolation. Yeah. There was like, you know, some of the other grads who were taking the class online we're in Kuala Lumpur, we're in, we're in South Korea and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and they were never able to come on campus for the first year and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I got to know them, you know, with TMI too, about like, oh my God, no, please do not overshare. <laughs> <laughs> You're not watching this, but there's, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, but it's, it's this like a space where people feel vulnerable, you know, and it's like you have your whole science world and how difficult difficult it is to do research, to verify the research, to get it peer reviewed, to like have a sustained career in the sciences is not is not an easy challenge. Yeah, and also, I mean, we have several means of communication, right? Like typically, we talk about giving presentations or writing papers, and also in the pandemic times, most of the communication had to happen online. You know, so yeah, yeah. how do you have to like? Re-evaluate the way you do your storytelling, depending on the media or the audience that you have. You know, uh, what are the challenges or the opportunities you have to like? I don't know. Uh, re, re rephrase the way you yeah. tell re your story. Re reframe the way we actually did a story with spouses of postdocs, like about five years ago. I, I, we started this program, and mm -hmm. because a lot of the international postdocs were men, <laughs> you know, and they had their spouses mm -hmm. and so that a lot of these spouses couldn't get work mm -hmm. you know they couldn't get a, a, a job big um visa what is it called the j2 visa if you're thank a you. scholar yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> but they did not allow them to work necessarily that if they had or they did not have children you know what what did they do during that time and so there was a, a sense that uh yeah there was they were they were in a, a place where they needed communion. They needed to see people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They needed people outside of their nuclear family or non-nuclear family. But so but we did these workshops around, you know, who they were. Like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And it turned out, you know, the, the story that they're telling them, this goes back to your reframing. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, this woman uh, came in and married and she was talking about... Uh, Oh, I only have a master's degree. You know, she kept that. I was, only have. That was part of her name. Okay. You know? Wow. It's like, yeah, I had to follow my, I had to follow my husband overseas, so I wasn't able to finish my, you know, like, and so this is the story that she kept saying. I'm like, well, is there, you know, can you explain this in a different way? Well, I spent six years in a PhD program. Which is a different story. Exactly, centering herself in the story. Oh, I've only got a man. I've only got a man. I spent six years as a as a, as a graduate student in this yeah at IIT Bombay or wherever she was yeah. at, and it's like that's you rephrase that you yeah, exactly. reframe the way that you talk about who you are. That's right. I mean, yeah, you, because it's you, like you have a, a lot of amazing international experience. But I, as I a still feel like student. a failure so many times, you know. <laughs> and I shut up. I, Come on, yeah, really, it's really it's like like imposter syndrome is right. a thing that everybody feels like. I mean, it's, it's yeah. very very yeah. common, especially in women, and we understand like the reasons why we feel like that, you know, because. I mean, it's about perfectionism, you know, it's about the fear of failure, yes. but you have to embrace the failure when you do science. So it's like such a weird feeling, especially when you are in such a like excellent and very prestigious place. Yes. You know, there's so much pressure that not even necessarily the environment gives you, but yourself put to, on, on your way, you know, it's and it's so hard to tell a story to yourself, yeah. you know, that right. uh, from, to, to, to keep from the perspective of your achievements rather from your things that yeah, don't work. Absolutely. I mean, it's okay to fail or it's okay, not, nothing has to be perfect, you right. know, every pass is different. You, I try, I mean, you, by the way, you have a, apparently only one life, so you have to try to live it the best you can, yeah. you know? And yeah. I tell this to myself because I also like face so many times in my right. life in which is like, why I am like this, why I yeah. keep failing, you know? And and the more I feel about that, the more pressure I'm putting myself, and the less I can do. Right. 
you know so so actually the more pressure you put on yourself the less you can do right That's oh yeah it's, it's so ironic you can I, yeah. you can get burned out by doing absolutely nothing Completely. you know and i have faced those moments in my life you know yes. it's a continuous fight you know against your own self yeah. so how can you i mean how can you tell do a storytelling your own brain right. to like you know bypass that feeling yeah. I, don't, I don't know but then I you, still you don't have go the answer. to the corner and pick up the dusty violin and yeah. just kind of go or back the piano to yeah but yeah. yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 mean, that's I like of, a lot of things. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. we've got to know each other a little bit. I know that you're you're a very physical soccer player. That you took a lot of the uh, martial arts. Yeah, this <laughs> <miss, miss> thing, <laughs> bicycling. You know, you're like, you're a real athlete of the heart in many ways. You know, and a scientist. But I mean, I'm curious about life, and that's what keeps yeah. me alive. You yeah. know, so it's like if I were only to do science with the brain that I currently have, I think I will feel constrained. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to speak about perfectionism, I think of that another thing with improvisation, like I said before, like making friends with failure, making friends with discomfort, making friends with um, having your expectations over upturned, I think is is good. I think it's a good antidote oh, yeah. for it's very healthy. So, yeah. yeah. And I would say here, especially because like there's so many people and I came from like being the best of my class yeah. to be like one of many, you right. know, and failing courses and failing, yeah. having like this, this than a perfect score in something. Yeah. And I was like, crying, like, really? you know, yeah. why this happened to yes, me, yes, you know? Yes. And it's like, you're going to fail. Oh. You know, you are going to yeah. fail. And le and and uh, living your life through a perspective of like, I am the best yeah. or I want to be the best. It's not necessarily like the right strategy, I would right. say, you know, because then it doesn't make it necessarily a good scientist. Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. Sometimes I also believe uh, that it's not just fear of failure, but it's also putting someone else, people around you on a pedestal higher than yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you look at all these accomplished, distinguished people, which is very common in, in a place like Caltech or any other position. You see people who are superstars, and when you're looking not from their perspective, not their journey, when you look from afar, they look spectacular, and in comparison, you feel diminished. Right. Oh, yeah. And uh, But you forget the fact that you are the hero of your own story mm -hmm. like you have a story and you're the hero of it it's all about marketing <laughs> yeah to be fair i do feel like that when i go to a colloquium or somebody like in my field or any other field and they start feeling like he got this prize he got this prize you know yeah. did like twenty thousand books or whatever <laughs> like two thousand citations it's like part of the way that science is being sold mm -hmm. and especially in american in the american uh, scientific community it's all about like selling your achievements. Right. Yeah. And it's a good thing, you know. I mean, you have to sell yourself, you know. I have to, I mean, you have to show that you are able to do what you do, but there's so much emphasis, you know, so much weight on that, a yeah. lesson to the human effort that br brought you to arrive to that, you yes. know. And in many times, just taking away the, the the efforts of other people around you that also help you, you know, like as you say, you know, you get win the Nobel Prize. Was it you just you, you know, the story that you tell, or it's like also your grad students or your community, or yeah. you know that supported your forces that were there, you know, helping you in in your daily life. You yeah, know? Mm -hmm. that's right. And um, kind of going back to what you said about, about the, you know, the big conversation amongst the, when we, I've been work, working with postdocs, we, we do like five weeks, we do like 15 weeks together, and like group comes in an hour. That's fine, that's fine. You know, <laughs> it grows. You know, one of the big issues comes down to that, that image of the hero, that they got there on um, this, trajectory that just did this is like no that is that's very very rare that you find that stellar career that goes up to the top and it's it's very situational at times and it can be very accidental and kids you know oh, yeah. and it, it isn't a straight line you know it is maybe you go mm, so so there's just so many ways to get to where you want to go and be satisfied with the research and to satisfy with the science and be respected about the science and not always comparing ourselves to Harry Gray, you know, who got his Nobel at 37, you know, it's like, I'll never be like wow. Harry Gray. It's like, well, no <laughs> one is going to be. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I meant David Baltimore. I'm sorry. Yeah. I meant David Baltimore. He got the yeah. Nobel at 37. So, yeah. you know, and he's what, 80 something now. And so you got the Nobel at like, yeah. Where do you go from there? Like, where do you, where do you go from <laughs> there? Like, the current president of my country is my age. No. Uh, yeah. Actually. Yeah. Holy wow. I was like, wow. I am uh, like, cool. if I want to be a politician, then it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's really dangerous to keep comparing ourselves. Oh, oh yeah. And no matter what field you're in, you know, totally. I, and I think it's harder with science. Like, 
Well, Sophia has like five more publications than I do. Like I, oh. I hate her for that. You know, I really, I really want to like her because she's a really fun person to hang out with. But I hate her. I hate her so much because she has so many more publications than I, than I do. We're friends, you know, we hang out, but I hate her. Oh you know? my god. <laughs> 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 no, really. <laughs> I, but I, have more, I, do you have, I, I only have three public <laughs> <laughs> They're not even in science. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for hating me. It's <laughs> a sign of respect. Every week, I'm here for you every week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just about selling yourself, though, it is like, it is like um, a, I don't know, it is the sort of like, double-edged sword or one of the yeah, perhaps unfortunate things about our culture, especially here in the States, is that like we here celebrate loud, like I said, it's like there's a couple of scientists that pop through to the pop culture and it's like the loud, funny ones. You know what I mean? It's like it's there's cel extroverts are celebrated, introverts can be overlooked. And like yeah. that is just baked into the cake of at least American culture for sure. Um, for better and for definitely for worse. Um, but and just Going back to improv too, I think like improvisation on its most basic level is just, yes, it is like a public speaking tool. It is like a little bit to like crack people out of their shells a little bit. And, um, you know, like I was saying, like people who aren't used to or don't have the natural proclivity to like take the stage and own it and like stand at the spotlight and like speak loudly, like use their voice, like mm -hmm. sing it to the back of the house, like that sort of um, stagecraft, which I think in another non-theatrical context could also just be called confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I think that those, um, you know, the more you do it, um, mm -hmm. I, I just think the stronger those think, muscles become. Actually, you mentioned something very critical yeah. uh, about our personality types, right? They're yeah. like the most extroverted people and they're yeah. like the more introverted ones. Yeah. And there's like the misconception and that in order to be an actor or to do this kind of thing, you have to be extroverted. And the contrary, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, th there's like, it's some kind of isolation so that all these extroverts can be like that. But again, then then you're portrayed in only one kind of people, right? right? Exactly. Like I, I have known a lot of people who like I can see clearly that they are more into the introvert side and they're so excellent improvisers and right. actors. They make such a different quality that I don't have that right. I admire because it brings so much texture, you know, to whatever we are doing. Absolutely. And and it, totally it, it, it also context. models. It also models. Like I'm watching Sophia on stage, you know, as a very shy, you know, mm -hmm. um, person. I'm like. Wow, this person she's pretending she's yeah, yeah. doing what I right. think it allows people to kind of reshape themselves yeah. in the light of someone else yes. who does have that that skill set and they like well she, and it gives you perspective she, her perspective changing absolutely it's liberating to try on different personalities yeah. to wear them for a temporary amount of time to to that's it's a freeing empowering yeah. liberating experience to do that i think and, and it's also like you're watching you improvise you know like when you when i first saw you start to improvise you took over every scene so physical you know, like i'm gonna take over the scene yeah. you know and she did and so i was watching you last night and she really allowed other people to play mm -hmm. And I think that's a real strength that that's people, that's true. I mean, that people, when people do have that, do we need of, to push themselves to act? I have to push myself back because right? yeah. I want to do everything, but yeah, yeah. but I know that it's not just about me; it's about everybody. So Absolutely. I feel sometimes like, did I do it wrong? Because I, it, they always say, "Go ahead and be loud," and it's like, "I am already loud." Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, right. Like I have to keep my personality, but also here you know leave yeah, the here. opposite yeah find the, the, find the body yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's still i think finding the, the right yeah balance to that right one of the keys about, mm -hmm. about improv and sketch comedy frankly mm -hmm. and i think comedy in general is like and this is one of the things that they talk about over and over again at at ucb and in generally but the idea is that like you know one of the principles of improv um, is like when you're in a scene finding what they call the game of the scene, which is like, what is the one joke? What is the one unusual thing? What is the one joke of the scene um, that we as a group and as a collective are acknowledging and are aware that this is the game we're playing? And if that's the one game we're playing, um, for instance, in the show last night, there was a very funny thing that Gigi came up with. It was like someone who is deathly afraid of four syllable words. Yeah, that so was so good. Funny, so funny, so weird. Okay, so let's say that's the game of the scene. Then the in a perfect platonic ideal of improv, every single other player in that scene would be contributing to that one 
different game. So everyone is making the same joke. Everyone is, is riffing and is contributing to the same idea. And I just, you know, that's like the meta, that's, I couldn't think of anything more broadly applicable than that in terms of like working in a group, collaborative work. It's like, how do we all like the cultivation of group mind? Um, are we all, think, are we all telling the same joke? Great, because if eight of us are and two of us are telling a different joke over here, mm -hmm. then the audience is, it's confusing, it's muddier. We're not communicating ourselves clearly. So I, I think that that is, again, it just hones that skill as well. of like every single thing can, should and can contribute to the one collective group idea that we're all trying to trying to that is so very important for yeah. scientists to have yeah because especially when we're in brainstorming sessions oh, wow. it's just not but even not not just uh, actually academy even in industry we have all these group brainstorming sessions where we're trying to converge on an idea and we have a we have a common goal that we want to tackle this project or we want to tackle this uh, we want to launch a new product mm -hmm. and then we have we are still fighting across like, okay, I want my idea to go in. Right. And mm -hmm. I want my uh, my solution to go in. Your solution is bullshit. Right. Well, <laughs> <is important. laughs> right. Actually, can, can I mention something? Uh, going a little bit back to, to the theme of like, Impro sorry, introverted versus extroverted. Mm -hmm. I remember a book calling about the power of introverts. Mm -hmm. and I read them, it gives the me a power shock. of introverts. Yeah, because especially in America, as you mentioned, we are praised being yes. extroverts, yes. you know, yes. like the one who screams the loudest. You're a go getter, go getter, go getter, yeah. go getter tigers. Yeah. And, and a story is um, uh, brainstorming. It's supposedly one of the best ways to get creative ideas. And apparently, it's not necessarily that the case. You know, so because like some people tend to overpower the others totally. and they impose ideas that are not necessarily the best, but just the loudest. Absolutely. So sometimes you have to give them like. Well, but I think yeah. that has a lot to do with facil facilitation. Yeah. I mean, of, uh, not uh, only brainstorming, uh, but also giving, yeah, I mean, facilitate. you also need your, uh, we're all about like making connections, but you also need a connection to ourselves, you know, yeah. like our own space to write our own ideas or to work on something like with our accepting our own neurodiversity right but, yeah but if i was yeah. facilitating that i would like those are some really great ideas we really haven't heard from sneha not that i would put her on the spot if you want to figure out like pass the ball around what, mm -hmm. what's going to be the motivating word or cue or trigger that's so you need a mediator in that case in that you person, a, shame her. That i would person. shame her <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, you don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in of groups uh, trying to go to in, uh, industry teams and everything and building this team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. To, get, to get them to open up. That's a good business yeah. idea. Super, super. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, from a New York science, science perspective, you know, like, collective creation, you know, versus, like, working by yourself, you know, like, mm -hmm. how does, how can you explain, like, the process? The other One thing is science is is a collective and the endeavor has been and will mm -hmm. be collective. Yeah. But it the collective in the sense does not have to be in the moment because we are technically collaborating with people who have long right. so <laughs> so true. On their work. Yeah, it's a good way to say it, you know. Yeah. It's a very good story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but now mm -hmm. also it doesn't have to be temporarily the same as well. I mean, we constantly chat over email or anything. We we just talk to people, uh, be sleep on ideas, and then get back mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, so right. Yeah. On the spot. But still, the receptivity increased. Like, I have, a, there are some email threads uh, in uh, where people, scientists, start fighting over each other's ideas wow. because they have proposed some ideas in the past, and they have earned their name with, by, uh, they got their name attached to certain ideas, and now when their ideas are being criticized or even a hint of a negative feedback and they will lose them so defensive yeah, yeah. so defensive so defensive yeah, 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 like, yeah i get it okay i know i know, <laughs> idea. I know it's your brain child right but this is the collaborative effort it's like yeah. we, we are trying to uh find the plot holes and trying to make make sense right. better that means mm -hmm. you have to be receptive to feedback oh, definitely anything i mean yeah, yeah. married to an idea is having unscientific at the very right exactly. you should be able to change your mind according to evidence right yeah, yeah. and also talk in a more respectful and uh, constructive criticism rather than launching personal attacks getting too defensive yes or uh, that happens a lot in science more often than you think because yep. big intellect yeah. equals big ego totally mm. i can imagine I can well the imagine. problem with ego is something that would be so relevant to work through improvisation through like courses yes. of storytelling yes. you know i think that yeah 
Mm -hmm. To your point, it's like, I mean, yeah. the arts, they say like, you know, in a writer's room, and it's like, best idea wins, doesn't matter where it comes from. It's just like, we're all agreeing that we're all like, whatever the best idea, whatever the best, funniest idea is, no matter who, it could be the writer's assistant, it could be the producer, it could be the writer, it could be the my eight-year-old kid. It's like, whatever the best idea comes from, that could, that should, there's a sort of a democracy of that. Mm -hmm. um, I also think if there's something related to like ego, Americans celebrating the individual, and there's something about improv that is also an antidote to that. There's something very sort of like delightfully socialistic about improv where it's like it it is a exclusively group endeavor and it's like i think i have a great idea for a scene like i said before i have a great idea for a scene this is my brainchild this idea i'm gonna come out whoops no one else is on board i guess we're not doing that then and it's like you need to be able to instantly instantly adapt to what the collective is up to as opposed to like your one funny idea that you've been sitting there like trying to figure out a way to like weasel into this funny improv scene um and it's that is also can be really counterproductive to like the gestalt and the whole of an, imp of an improv group. Yeah. You also, yeah, and you also yeah. need to have that idea that you're going to throw out. This sounds like a dumb idea, but then you're like, yeah, but it's my dumb idea, and it's not, it's not a bad dumb idea. <laughs> And they're like, well, it's not even really a bad dumb idea, but it's still a dumb idea. It's like, well, it's mine. But it's mine, and we can unpack it because there's some merit in it. Because you know, I have credibility as right. a scientist because this is how I'm thinking. Right. So I don't. I want to maintain that dumb idea because that dumb idea is going to turn into tech innovation that's going to change the world. But right now, people are going, oh, that's yeah. dumb. You know, so you. You have to have that dumb idea, which is like yeah. you know, a bad improv scene. Right. There's always some kind of treasure in there. There's always some kind of jewel that that's in there, and it just depends on, um, yeah, it depends on you know taking that dumb idea and like making it become something else, or, or untangling it, or finding all the different streams that are coming into it. Because obviously, you put a lot of thought into it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. You make an excellent point here because improv also doesn't mean that you have to conform. Mm. The societal expectations, but again, like like you said, it depends upon what kind of criticism is leveled against yeah, you. If yeah, if people right. are going to launch personal attacks and meet them rationally and disrespecting that's your the worst. that's not that's that's not something you have to stand for it or yes and to yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. exactly yeah. It's no, that's not how we talk to each other. Right. Well, that's how I talk to you, but that's not acceptable. Right. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to accept the way you're talking to me right now. Yeah, I pay your salary though. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, I pay your salary. Yeah, yeah. right. Thanks, pay your salary. What happens there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right. Your idea is so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but how would you play that out though? I mean, what, how do you, how would, you, how, do, how would you play that out? Uh, it, it's you very know, difficult when you're in a situation like this, it's a total power trip. Power struggle because even even academia is full of uh, power play because the structure is not at all not at all uh, very very healthy, especially grad students versus advisors, and there's a lot of thing happening there. Yeah. It, like for example, if I'm in industry, I can if my manager is being toxic or something, I can just say, hey, to hell with you. I have ten other yeah. right. uh, offers land, lining That's up. Right. Is right. that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the field. <laughs> there's more literature in, in industry so, yeah, yeah but in academia mm -hmm. it's been a, it's kind of a power struggle because there are these players who are very very influential in the field and you don't, don't want to make enemies with them because they're going to stay it's a small community yes. because whatever research you are doing it's a very isolated nuclear community and if you make one enemy, enemy with an influential person and that's going to mm -hmm. affect you affect you in a okay. negative way so that's that person, influential person, does hold a lot of power over. Yeah. And how do you go ahead and and like say, okay, or maybe you should not uh, do it this way, or you should not act this way, or maybe yeah. your idea, even like for example, if a young PI is trying to uh, criticize an old PI's idea, mm -hmm. established yeah. PI's idea, now they are very scared of doing that. Uh, yeah. sure. Even I would be scared of doing. That. Yeah. Is that what you were? Huh? Is that what you were? In Madras. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm thinking like one case, I, I sadly forgot the name of the of the female scientist who did this, but uh, was she was doing her PhD thesis and she discovered like, via her data analysis that actually the sun was made of mostly of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And she presented the results to the, 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 her advisor. And he's like, no, no, this is too much. Don't do it because it's, it's too disruptive. And she turned out to be true, you know, and she didn't get recognized for many years. So she was the first one to discover it. You know, just because of fear mm -hmm. of criticizing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, of disrupting. You know, mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, uh, 
and, and the, the point is like, yeah, many times crazy ideas, you know, turn out on not to be that crazy, but in right. our present perspective, there are so many things that do not persist, you know, because they're all crazy, but when one of those crazy ideas maybe what changed your vision, exactly right. so you should like, yeah, they may be crazy, you know, exactly. but but let's see what's what's good about them, you know? Yeah. I think the mm -hmm. culture should shape a change completely to respecting the ideas and not the, uh, uh, not prejudicing the people too much, because the current culture of once you are once you propose an idea, you're, you're uh, perpetually tied to that idea mm -hmm. and that gives you status and power. So people are very protective, fiercely protective of their ideas, but they don't miss the fact that ideas have an existence out independent of human, humanity. Yeah. Like if, if not you, someone else would come up because it's just pattern matching. Yeah. Things are all there. If not you, someone else would find yeah, it. Of course, you Steve Jobs, it would have been the next guy. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah, just... why do we deify the the individuals to your point before them. Yeah, and then and like Tesla technology is yeah. open sourced. Like yes. we can go to that. It's like, yeah. thank you for sharing that, but we have to, to make that. Yeah. yeah. So to I your point before, the idea is the hero, not the person. Yeah, so that, exactly. Yeah. In that case, I think all this toxicity around that would, would go away if we kind of respect ideas more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, do you, do you, oh, I was going to say, do you, do you think that science is here to be shared by all scientists? Or is there, I mean, obviously, we, there's certain, guy, I mean, there's there's certain guide, guidelines about certain viruses that maybe shouldn't be let out and like how you I don't build, know. I don't know how many people read my papers, not so many, maybe. You know, <laughs> in terms of like the contribution you feel you have, you know, it's something that is relevant, but your audience not necessarily is that big, you know. But it's it's a combined action. Sometimes I, I, it's something that I struggle to, you know, feel like, wow, well, I spend so much of my time on something that maybe five people will read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome but, to the arts. <laughs> really? Oh wow. I, thought it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean uh, and that brings me to something that maybe we never discussed. We, are you, we, yeah. what, I'm like, I don't know how much time do so you have. Like you know? Welcome to the arts for I mean, like, Welcome like, to the liter the, the scientific literary world that they're only gonna read. What's the, what's are the limitations, for example, of finding a connection between these two things, improvisation right. and science, uh, storytelling and science? Are there any things that caring too much about it can be actually wrong in a way? Caring too much about the science? No, I mean, making so much effort to use improvising, like literally into my daily life or storytelling. And can in any way be actually harmful? You know, I'm, mm. I'm think, I, I never thought about it. I'm thinking, what could be something wrong? No. So the continue you telling your bad story. Uh, yeah, no, keep telling us that bad story. Yeah, just keep improvising that bad story. I mean, what do you mean? Like, mm -hmm. what? When does it get too bad? Like allowing people to play the same narrative over again. Maybe that's like victimhood as a person. It's just like yeah, I'm a I mean, victim, and then everything I do is good, and everything everyone's against me. Or like, <laughs> I, one thing, I don't know. I think one negative I can see that are. Uh, some ideas just take hold of the public side, guys, like at, the, at this moment of time, and they capture our public imagination and the rest of the ideas, although they might have potential or future promise, but people just don't see it because the time isn't right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's as if stories of pandering to the public opinion mm -hmm. might... Pandering to the public opinion, no. I mean, being a powerful storyteller can be very harmful if your intentions are... Of course, are right. not nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to put it in a nice I, way. I think that uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago there was Sarah Palin was running for the vice presidency mm -hmm. with John McCain, right? Mm -hmm. Years ago. Anyway, so um, their platform was against big government. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't want government in their lives, you know. Mm -hmm. And she used a phrase that became synonymous with anti. Democratic, big D Democratic uh, Party platform, which was that the Medicare that the Democrats are going to help give to the rest of our country, they're going to create death panels. Mm -hmm. So this is a phrase that she mm -hmm. used to to go against the Democrats, right? It was her phrase, if the Democrats get in power and then they're given power, if, you, if the government is going to take over the control right. of your health care and what doctors you can see, they're going to send you to a death camp. And that was a phrase that, that she wow. used. And, and they, they get to decide who lives and dies. Mm -hmm. And so it was like immediately when you said death camp, I was like, yeah, I'm not against that. <laughs> so you know, it became this like really brilliant way 
of saying something that would trigger this emotional response like i fucking hate democrats yeah you know or or, or you know those liberal elites man yeah. they want to kill all of us yeah. with these death panels they want to take over my so yes. that's like as a story that totally. becomes really intense how do you overturn that because it's so connected to emotion Completely. and ideology and right. totally contaminate this idea of, of health care is actually good for a country exactly in the social fabric i believe that yeah. that that's one of the reasons why democracy is good and yeah. this is the biggest dom democracy in the world right maybe not the most efficient but it's like the best we have and the best we got and then there's a, a, a social fabric there's a net yeah. There's a network of um, of uh, services yeah. that democratic institutions yes. serve. So if it does it, who does it benefit when I try to talk against that? Yes, you know by saying, "Well, oh, they're going to kill my friend." Right. If my friend doesn't really what doesn't want to be. You know, he 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 needs a liver transplant, and the government's the only one that's yeah. going yeah. to do that. And to your point, Sophia, like storytellers, good crafts people with nefarious means is a dangerous thing i mean like we were uh, when we went out for a beer after the show we were talking about, about, we think about purpose, sorry. <laughs> well we were talking about scientology came up somehow and there was talking about scientology okay Elf now this has the, the, what he's going to talk about right now <laughs> he's, he's, he doesn't know anything about it yeah that's right <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Are, are mentioned here are the opinions of each yeah, person, an individual, they do not represent <laughs> the, the <laughs> thoughts of a general. That's right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 We shouldn't talk about it. That's yeah. right. Yes, yes. A little subset. With all due respect. With all due respect. Yeah. You did it in a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Science. But he was a, uh, a sci-fi writer, Elf Hunter, who was like a science fiction writer, who, who you know, has lived here in Pasadena. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, you know, I think that the story goes, and maybe please correct me if I'm wrong, but like his, uh, a friend was like, hey man, like this um, book that you wrote is really good. Like you should turn this into, <laughs> should turn this into religion. Get yeah. like a tax break about it and yeah. make this a religion. And he's like, oh, all right. And like, so he did. But to your point about like- But it's a cross between psychoanalysis yeah. and maybe people say black magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, a certain, yeah. certain, yeah early 19 yeah early 1900s or mid early 1930s yes um practices totally. of, of black magic occultism yeah. so it was like it's melting of that wow melting of yeah that. very interesting things yeah no it was a very it was a very powerful man, and it had a big uh, it had a lot to do with the founding of jpl but that's another story Ooh. um Okay, interesting. Yeah, interesting. so but yeah, because you know, anyway, that, that's a whole other thing. I would say with improv though, yeah, I, and this is maybe a niche thing, whatever, as we're just brainstorming, blue skying, like what are some negative effects or some like mm -hmm. potential downsides, or whatever. Uh, I do understand, especially if you've been doing improv for a long time. My friend, my best friend and comedy partner, Bill, um, was improv, I took all the classes and did all the improv, and he ultimately, I mean, he's a writer and he wanted to be a storyteller and he got frustrated with the ephemera, with this sort of ephemeral nature of improv. We make it up and then it goes away, which is the beauty of it and the sort of the art and the delight of it. But I think Billy had this idea of like, man, that was such a funny idea. This idea of like someone terrified by four syllable words. Oh, I wish we could like script that and make it a more concrete, that's, that's concrete. coherent thing. Exactly, exactly. I can, but I, I'm just sort of imagining that I could I could see that people being frustrated with the um well, over time with the the transient, mm -hmm. what's the word I'm looking for? Ephemeral, like, like ephemeral nature. Also with music, this I feel the same. Yeah. And I, I have I really love improvising music, yeah. especially with yeah. my violin. And it's very liberating, but at the same time, it feels like there's some things I want to develop. There's uh, there's a beauty in repetition. There is. Yeah. <laughs> Even you, you say you don't like it. I, there are some things which I don't like repetition, but you always learn another type of complexity within the same thing because you find levels of meaning right. or layers and layers and you are internalizing that, you know? So yeah. I, I think shouldn't be life shouldn't be all improvising. You shouldn't every, just, just improvise you, a presentation, you know? Yeah, every time kind of preparation. Yeah, yeah. I think it's about finding the balance. Yeah. Totally. Right? I yeah. had the same experience in dancing. Like mm -hmm. I... I do not like repetition in anything. I do not like choreographed dance. Oh. Basically, when I dance, I feel like I don't want to keep track of what's coming next. I just want to let loose, follow the music, but, and just just go with it. Let the music drive your body, not yeah. just think about what's going on. Yeah. But when I said the same thing to my friend, she said, I could never do that. Right. I need control. Yeah. Yeah. I need to know where I'm going and how I'm going. Exactly. 
to say that's a bad, bad thing because I can clearly see that there are two different schools of thought here. And one is totally surrendering control and yeah. one is being in control. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying one is good and one is yeah, bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, because there are different mm -hmm. people who personality types some might prefer one kind over the other. And I think there is beauty in both art forms. Like I would say, yeah, there's so much beauty in the diversity of human beings and yeah. minds, right? Yeah. Which brings me to maybe, actually, that's the last topic that I put in the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the contribution of the improvisation storytelling? We're creating diverse perspectives and experience exactly. into yeah. our stories yeah. to help yeah. create more inclusive and equitable Inclusion, right? and equity. scientific community. I, yeah. I really think like empowering everybody to like experience improvisation in this collaborative environment or tell our own stories helps to bring all kinds of yes. diversity to the well, to the front line. I, yeah, and I think yeah. a, a large, large part of it is the interdisciplinary work that Caltech is really known for. I mean, it's one of the reasons why they're the, the top research institute in the world is that they have smaller groups and obviously more highly qualified students and grad students and postdocs here, obviously. Sure, don't <laughs> oh, sure, like that. Um, <laughs> and then you've got groups that are willing to work occasionally across boundaries, which I think is one of the things that you're doing with macroeconomics and, and, uh, and cognition and brainwave activity, you know, that's really fascinating kind of work, you know, how chemists are maybe working with with geologists or, you know, the chemists are working with um, like Aris Rizakas, you know, as his um, earthquake guy, you know, how is, you know, how do you look at the shaking of the earth like a dance, you know, mm. like how are the yeah. different... Wasn't like the guy who created the Richter scale, he was like a mathematician or something and he just was passing by the, the geologists and they suggest this and he came up with it, yeah. uh, like, yeah, thanks cool. to that random uh, inter collaboration. I don't remember this full story, but I heard this quite cool. Yeah. 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 I will cool. edit it and put the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah exactly. But I think that's what it does. It takes about, you and I met, mm. you know, when Colin was at the table, like, wow, I know who you are. You, I, I know his research. I'm like, this is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you're working with him, but you're also related to these other divisions that are doing other kind of cutting edge work. So the more that we, I think, the more we can kind of combine these different um, uh, disciplines in yeah. ways that help, like, for example, you as an astrophysicist, you know, working with a neuroscientist. You know, like, Which I, I, I have done a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, have done a little bit, you know. Yeah. So working across these boundaries. Yeah. But I, I think that, and that's why I think maybe coming back to the storytelling, the, the, the community of practice of storytelling uh, and the mingling of like yeah. uh, offering opportunities for people across the the hierarchy or the caste system of science research uh, of like well I'm not going to hang out with uh, with you why should I hang out with you like well why not you know it's like I learned so much from you already you know yeah. it's like allowing this uh, creating the conditions whereby we can meet and talk and like find out your dumb ideas and my dumb ideas together and actually might come up with a really exactly. cool idea yeah. that will make us i mean um, and and sometimes it is dumb because it's outside of the status quo and right. that's why you have to disrupt in order to advance right, right? Yeah, yeah. And, or finding this like interdisciplinary path can take you to interdisciplinary careers yeah, yeah, that yeah. you didn't expect to have you know yeah. and then maybe you feel more fulfilled uh, or you have more experiences to decide actually what you want with your life. Yeah. You know? I think that's the interesting part. So yeah. and I think part of it is that that disruptive nature of like going to this improv class yeah. and going, I'm terrified. I'm on stage and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm that's my time. what I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm going to stand up in here and, and hopefully someone will come in and give me a couple of tools. That's right. So that I can actually make eye contact right. with someone in the universe before right. I'm 30. I think the life goals. Yeah. <laughs> Accomplished. There is like, and <laughs> my life is complete. Yeah. <laughs> This is being talking about Brian just said, I think that there, with mm. improv too, there's a great humbling. It's a very humbling <laughs> um, experience to all stand on stage with a group knowing nothing, not knowing what anyone's about to say, but fully committed to the idea of telling a story together made up on the spot. And I think that it is it, intrinsically hierarchy dismantling. 
to yeah, do that. Right. That's I think it's point. It, it does it, dismantle higher. We're control. all on the same playing field. You could be your fancy, you know, uh, Nobel Peace Scholar, and I could be a lowly freshman, whatever. But like, we're on the improv stage together, and we are equal. We that both be, know nothing. It would be so interesting yeah. to have an improv class with actual <laughs> Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> He was in the previous transdisciplinary conversation with Scott Simon oh. because he was a friend of Dean Oliver, the guy who gave the talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's a statistician. So he, and he worked for the yeah, 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 he's a right. Christian MBA. And that was a very interdisciplinary path. He's yeah, an yeah. engineer. Cool. And ended up on the MBA, which is yeah. so cool, right? Yeah, yeah, and funny, yeah. which is my economies, and you know, on the yeah. senior science and stuff yeah. like that. Yes. Yeah. And this path like interconnecting such a random and amazing yes. way to my personal perspective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if we were to make some more more of like a campus-wide initiative to like make a point of going to meet people that you don't know. Yeah. Like, oh, we're gonna the, the EAS is gonna go hang out with BBE. You know, like bio, biology, biological engineering, the mm -hmm. BBEs will yeah. hang out with. I mean, we the, do sometimes with that with postdocs. We have yeah, there's like something with postdocs, yeah. but like with grad students. Mm -hmm. to, it doesn't have them open? Not too open. Maybe in the initial orientation week, we uh, didn't have something, but. Yeah. Uh, it's fine. Uh, too busy just doing, doing, doing your own thing. Yeah. In bachelor. Staying yeah. in your lane. Stay yeah. in your lane. But you're in a lot of lanes, though. You're kind of kind of going into these different lanes. Okay. Well, I cannot be contained. That's it. I would not be contained. <laughs> Put that on the wall right there. Right? That's the title. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I Thank will you. always remember you now. From the yeah. Yeah. I cannot be <laughs> That is they care who cannot be contained. <laughs> and it's so self-affirming. Yeah. You know? But it's mm -hmm. but it's not um, you know, some people talk about there being an um uh, immodest, that there's there's um there's a there's a, a kind of a modesty that scientists have, especially in Cal Tech, I found there's a certain modesty, but I think it's sometimes my friend talked about it as being inappropriate modesty. Mm -hmm. That no. that that you've gone to the moon. You've gone to you've gone to Mars. You like figured out how to make your helicopter go up and spin around, and then you're you're talking with someone. Yeah, yeah, I, I did that in the moon. It's like, okay, come on, you fucking did that on the it's moon. Like false modesty. I'm in Mars. I'm Mars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that you know, just owning that. Yeah, I'm badass. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. I, I will not be content. Fishing, fish for totally. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. Actor anyone, anyone could have done yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Could, like, yeah. no. Yeah. So yeah. it took me two decades to figure that shit out. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? I don't swear. No. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, modesty is a very appealing thing, uh, appealing quality in scientists. I do agree that. It is, an, you say, it's an appealing quality. Sometimes. And uh, it, so basically, yes. humility and modesty also correlates with ability to accept your own mistakes yes. so yeah. and uh, just be more adaptable. Criticism too, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. So that that also a humbling experience that like the more you know, you realize the more you don't know. Right. That, that's, but that's, but that's healthy that's, humility. Yeah. That's healthy humility. I guess that's, that's, well, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's healthy um, ego, right? Yeah, it is. That's like, healthy ego. That's yeah. what we want. We all want to have that that healthy ego, you know, with all these other voices and selves and discarded energy that's around. It's like, I'm not that good. I know I'm not that good. No, I'm trying to hang on to yeah. have a rational, good ego that's intact that does like the balance, work. right? Uh, yeah. Balancing your ego with your humility, with your modesty. You're yeah. saying what you know, what you don't know, yeah. you know, and growing all the time. It, yeah. It's good. It's it's important to have a healthy ego, not to be battered all the time. Like, I don't know how to do research. Right. Well, why are you here? I don't know why I'm here. But uh, <laughs> you know, you're here because you're good and you're credible and you're effective and you worked hard to get here. Yeah. And then right there, it gives you that sort of built-in um Credibility, you know, because that you are here for a reason. Like there's a lot of people. I mean, there's there's a very small community. If it's only two thousand graduate students, there's yeah, like a five hundred set postdocs. I I think it's more. Or I don't know exactly. Yeah. What was it? It's there's a lot of postdocs, uh, but uh, maybe seven hundred or something. Or? Yeah, I, I would say it's less than half. Yeah, so I don't know exactly there's, how much. There's, there's yeah. under a thousand 
undergrads. Oh. There's about 2,000 yes. grad students. And wow. there's about 75, 700. I don't know. Exactly the number. Under 1,000? Yeah. There's only like 500 faculty, too, right? Wow. Yeah. I, definitely probably less. Yeah, but it's today. small, but yeah. it's a small campus. I mean, yeah. And so the, 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 the kind of talent that gets brought yeah. is, you know, the atom atomized, is that the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's not quite. It's yeah. great no, time. Literally, it's at all, but <laughs> atomized? Yeah. Vaporizer? No, <laughs> I think another, like, big, Huh? Curated, yeah, exactly. Curated. Oh wow, it's such, such a fancy word. Curated, genius. yes. Curated. It's a, it's a, genius. It's a good word, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other like big. Sorry. Uh -huh. Sorry. No. <laughs> I think the other like big overlap with with improv too, and like talking about the humility, like healthy humility of the science of science and scientists, is like the thing that I admire about the scientific community, and the reason that I put scientists on a pedestal personally is because we run you, they run towards the unknown towards the things that we don't know for sure. Uh, and that, again, is what improvisation is. It's like, impro like not what's known, not what's scripted, but the exact deliberately going towards what is not known and uh, living in that discomfort um, because there's only room for exploration and discovery. So I think that that's where like why improvisation and that's again in the, um, uh, I would say like the first prong of like improv is great for scientists is to like sort of to just sort of like buoy that and underline that instinct and also the communication thing which we talked about first but just like um you know ideas i'm not i don't really even know if i mean this but like ideas are only as good as they can be communicated really it's like as they can be understood so it's like there is um there's there's that sort of like just public speaking honing that skill as well that i think is really good yeah and you know what? I'm going to reframe my high school experience. I didn't fail my science classes. I passed most of the classes I took in high school, <laughs> except for a few. That's what I'll say. <laughs> That's what I'm going to reframe my Power. narrative. Sorry, I'm going to reframe my, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I didn't fail physics. I did my best. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and maybe also the school system also wasn't. Yeah, well, that was. Mm, good, yeah. I mean, sometimes they. People learn and, and appreciate things in a very different way. Right. You know? No, no, they're just they just don't. They're just dumb. Yeah, yeah. they're just dumb. They're not going to survive their their lives. <laughs> schools are not meant for everybody. Uh, that not in the way they are. It's yeah. irony, Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, What's sorry. Next topic is on how uh, people place science over arts, mm. and okay. everyone's supposed to. You only go to arts when you're dumb, especially that's mm. the narrative. And <laughs> yeah. People who are in the higher uh, higher cognitive yeah. capacity yeah. go to the science, and I think that's a false narrative. Yeah, yeah. very it's a false yeah. binary. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 Arts, uh, I mean, there's a distinctive human capacity for art and also for science, and I think we need to embrace both and both enrich and enhance life. Yeah. I think. It's yeah. like I, and I, I think that my fun of my 16 years being here that the one the, the best the, the most well-adjusted scientists in the company that I met technologists researchers engineers I, that, that have a combination of, of, of the two they're not all technical skills that they're also being able to live in their body they're able to other you know dust off your violin and, mm -hmm. and play something. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a sports activity. It's not necessarily art. So much, but that finding this other thing that's going to help, like a lot of uh, scientists I'm, I'm finding are really good with music in some way. There's something about that chord structure. And a lot of love, I got a cup of JPL. They have an amazing choir. They have an amazing band. They have... They all come down here and they work with the orchestra and the, and the woodwind. Many of the skills are complementary, well, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm very happy yeah. that I have the chance to study music from my, my childhood yeah, because yeah, it taught yeah. me so many things. Playing in an orchestra yeah. taught me to listen, to collaborate, yeah. you know, to understand a like, you know, a collective. Yeah. Or to be persistent, you know, especially mm -hmm. especially being persistent. Yeah. I think that's a quality that you need yeah. for learning and skill uh, in in anything. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I think it is owning, having both of those, you know, that that binary disrupted, so that it somehow evolves into the sort of the natural life of the scientist. Is because yeah. curiosity is part of part of your part pursuit. Of everybody, you have, you know, everybody was a child of your students. Yeah. This is, this is this, you know? yeah. So we don't want to lose that. Childlike curiosity when we turn 31. Right, right. Oh, well, more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really curious about anything anymore. Yeah. Really? Yeah.
So you always have, and so I think that's part of the creative act is that yeah. of being curious. It's like, I want to find something out. But no, 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 Adam, don't think about that. Yeah, so, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, then I won't. I wouldn't yeah. think about that at all. But yeah. of course, you're always going to think about it. Yeah, right, right. Especially the more they tell you not to. Think yeah, about it. don't think about elephants. Don't, don't yeah, don't think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. More, I got to find out about an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. You might know fun facts, but yeah. last name means an elephant. Okay. Really? Yeah, really? Cool. What, 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 what is your language? What is your name? Inu. That means elephant. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Do you have many your, elephants your in your in your region? What's what's elephant? Elephant Inu. 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 And Got it. So do you have elephants in your region? We do in the south. In the south, not exactly in my state, but in the south. Yeah, we do have elephants. Oh, God. What is that? Is that a, is that a telephone word? It's Bangaram. Bangaram and Skolgi. Yes. Skolgi. Yeah. Cool. And when do you say that? Hmm? When do you say that? Have you used that use that phrase? Bangaram. Bangaram. Uh, oh. A friend of mine used to always say that. Uh, oh, that's so good. Like the gold or. No, it's just as a darling. Oh, darling. As a as an alternative form for darling, when you say you are my gold. Oh, you are. Oh. Gold. Yeah, bling. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Not to go all the way back to the beginning and plumb the, plumb the depths of your upbringing, but you were saying that you were was so scientific oh, focus, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> plumb, plumb it. <laughs> um, but what, out of my, just out of curiosity, what was like the um, artistic? Were there, were, like, was there music played in your house, or were you like, did was there, were you going to see theater? Was there, what was like your artistic input? Books. Books. Yeah, stories. Yeah, 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 cool. Release. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> what are some of your favorite books? <laughs> uh, I mean, I started like everybody else with Harry Potter. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. Science text. But actually, yeah. before that, before that, my I started my literary journey through British classic literature. So, my, my very first novel is Great Expectations yeah. by Charles mm -hmm. Dickens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that there's beauty in. Oh, Dickens. I love oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Music, literature, mm -hmm. any paintings, anything classic. I yeah. Love. Oh, Jules Verne, for example, is my yeah. favorite. The one favorite science fiction yeah. writers, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's from my the state in which I studied in. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's <laughs> art. Yeah, art. Have you ever written? Have you ever tried to write fiction yourself? I did. Yeah. Actually, it's in a creative writing course here at Caltech. Oh, that, that course is great. Although the, everyone's a bunch of undergrad, I was the only grad student there, hmm. but I loved it. Who's the teacher of that class? Is Eden, it? Eden Lepucky. She is amazing. Who's this? Right? She's amazing. She, this is this woman, Eden Lepucky, who is a novelist. And I know her because she's like a mom, like she and my wife and I are friends. They're like in the same like mom group, whatever. She is, she has a novel called California, or if you've read it. it is yes. Uh, I haven't read it, but yeah. She's wonderful. Yeah. I, uh, I know that she taught a class here. That's so awesome. What was the exercise that really triggered the uh, the your response so much about what was there was an exercise in particularly that really connected to you in the creative writing class or just the overall? It is um, just an overall experience. Yeah. One interesting thing that really uh, affected me is just disrupting the tradition, even mm -hmm. in writing. Disrupting like, the tradition. Oh, wow. Because That's good. Uh, I think wow. we. Uh, it, Originally, story is supposed to be like a pre-tax pyramid, right? Like you start with setting up the background and then you reach, you you set up the narrative, then you reach a climax and then you resolve it. It's like a pyramid which is followed by many traditional Occident writers, style writing, right? Stories. But uh, what we learned in that creative writing class are how contemporary writers are disrupting that tradition and introducing new forms, new styles, mm -hmm. and which are not exactly intuitive, but just as powerful. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite writers, and not just me, but I don't know if you guys have read any George Saunders, who's like a fantastic mm -hmm. short story writer and just writer in general, but he talked about interdisciplinary. He was a, um, worked as a scientist, as a uh, engineer, and then worked for a big oil company and had some moral um, misgivings about that and sort of stopped doing that and then got into creative writing like later later in his life in his 40s or whatever and is now like the preeminent short story writer. But I think that he, and he's talked in many interviews about how it was his um, experience in the sciences and engineering and in um, working for this gnarly oil whatever, um, that really inspired, like it informs all of his writing. It's all in there. And like, mm -hmm. to me, he's one of the greatest 
living examples of like um, of a melding of the sciences and the arts. He's like uh, mm. sort of like George Saunders. George Saunders, the best. So good. Not the actor George Saunders. No, no, no. Yeah, no. George Saunders. He he's fantastic. But even the puck, love her, man. Love her so much. So I, I see that Brian is looking at his kids. phone. I guess you have time. Oh, to yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a I have a friends of ours are coming down. We haven't seen them in like five so years. We're I think dinner with them for the sake of the Sorry, conversation and um, for like, editing, I think I, it's. Oh, yeah. hey. There's still a recording hey, happening hey. here. <laughs> God, I didn't we're here. Yeah. She didn't hey. tell us who was going to be here. Okay. I'm going to stay huh, right I'm here. Gonna, I'm there. <laughs> so I will say goodbye officially to this. I will edit it somehow. But yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Guys, you this was so good. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can join us last minute. Yeah. Uh, that was, this was perfect. Good. Yeah. Good. I hope the edition <laughs> works. It's such a pleasure. Absolutely. Want to come take your next Thanks.